Dr. Kasib, bring a very interesting point that we would like to spend uh, uh, some time on. Uh, you know, very thoughtful thinking that after all, I look at the nuances and the details of the therapy, and if a patient is hep C, I do this, and if a patient is hep B, I do that. And I would like to kind of dissect this a little bit further. And I'll start with Anthony again. So uh, preference of choice, and let's go backward all the way to uh, the scenario of uh, uh, first line with the choice of uh, sorafenib, lenvatinib, and then second line, cabozantinib, ramesirumab, and also rigorafenib. And let's take a scenario, patient with hepatitis B. What will be your preferred choice, or you are totally agnostic to the diagnosis, uh, the, the etiology? You know, this is a challenging area because we actually do not have definitive data on therapy and etiology. We, as you know, have lumped all these patients together. We've at times stratified by etiology, um, but uh, none of the trials are definitive. Now, as uh, Dr. Kasseb mentioned, with sorafenib, there are some uh, post hoc analyses showing that the hep C subset of patients seems to particularly benefit from this. So I think it would be reasonable uh, to consider that data when treating a hep C patient. Uh, the lenvatinib study uh, had significant accrual from Asia and hepatitis B patients, and they seem to do well. Again, this is based on subgroup analyses, uh, so subgroup analyses cannot be used as definitive guidance to, to guide the clinical practice. But there's certainly a, a hypothesis generating, and, and you know, one could consider them. So I guess I'm giving a complicated answer because I do not believe that we have definitive data on how to treat different etiologies differently. Uh, however, I would respect the idea of individualizing therapy. I think that's great. Uh, where I think it's useful to individualize therapy is liver function. Uh, so when we talk about the good CHALPU B patients, the B7, B8, who don't have refractory ascites who are not actively encephalopathic and whom we might treat with systemic therapy. As you said in your introduction, all the trials took CHALP-UA patients. So how do we treat CHALP-UB? We extrapolate. So there, it's important to remember that the data is limited and we have data with sorafenib from registry studies uh, like Gideon and we have from your initial study with the phase two with Sorafne where there was a CHALP-UB uh, uh, small number of patients. So at least we have some safety data for Sorafne with CHALP-UB. Similarly, we have some data with nivolumab in a prospective cohort in Checkmate 040 where patients with B7 and B8 cirrhosis were enrolled. Again, they were the good B7 and B8 patients, like I mentioned earlier, but at least showed similar safety to nivolumab and CHALP-UA and, and relatively similar response rate of about 12%. So that's a subgroup where I'm cautious because we don't have data, for example, about the safety of the other agents. Uh, and, and it's important to, to maybe develop more da data in that space. Uh, thanks for bringing this up, Anthony. Actually, it's nice and it really, it really reassess uh, or reassures us and same time perplexes us a little bit about the multiple kind of, you know, dimensions that we need to look into regard to NHCC patients, among which other than etiology, as we also heard about the extent of cirrhosis. But let me go stick to the etiology component for a second. And uh, Catherine, as you are an expert and you're a hepatologist, teach us like, hep B, hep C, I mean, uh, is it like they just were standing at like a coffee shop and they were given B and C back to back or what, what's the difference? The, so the hepatitis B and hepatitis C are, are very different viruses. Um, they just happen to be labeled with letters. So hepatitis B is a virus, as you know, it's very Asian predominant, um, but that virus actually gets into the nucleus of the hepatocyte and it actually can integrate itself into the genome of the hepatocyte. As DNA because. As DNA, yeah, yeah. exactly. And, that, and then that will then turn on oncogenes and can cause hepato hepatocellular carcinoma in the absence of cirrhosis and chronic liver damage. They can have very normal livers. Hepatitis C, on the other hand, stays in the cytoplasm of the cell, which is actually why we can cure hepatitis C relatively easily, whereas hep B, we can't cure it yet. Uh, we can just suppress it. And hepatitis... I like the yet, by the way, because yet. I know there's work going We're on. We're working on it. Absolutely. Exactly. Yeah. But hepatitis C, generally patients get cancer from hepatitis C once they've developed more advanced disease with bridging fibrosis or cirrhosis, and it's that chronic damage over time that then causes the hepatocellular carcinoma. 
fair. Before we go back to the systemic therapy, but while we're on the subject of the uh, uh, virus itself, and I'll really actually, admittedly, I'm taking advantage. I have two great hepatologists with us. Uh, Catherine already described the differences. And I would like Peter to tell us uh, the story that we hear quite a bit about sometimes, a patient who has hepatitis C-related HCC. They have the virus, they have the disease. And let me be very clear, the disease is stage four. Metastatic is spread. Unfortunately, it's not a good story in regard to the extent of disease. Would you treat the virus? <laughs> so um, clearly in the subset of patients who have advanced disease, um, one has to weigh in the potential benefit from cure of hepatitis versus the uh, life limitation that cancer might uh, subject the patient to. The uh, ASLD, our Liver Society, and the Infectious Disease Society of America have joint HCV guidance, which is published online, hcvguidelines.org, uh, which anybody can access. And it states very generically that any patient who has hepatitis C is a candidate for therapy, assuming they have some reasonable life expectancy. A life expectancy generally of a year or more is considered uh, enough for one to justify treatment. Uh, and therefore, I think in the era of the time when we can potentially offer many of our patients with uh, BCLC stage C metastatic disease, uh, treatments that could potentially make them in multiple lines of therapy live more than a year, there is a pretty good justification to doing this. There may also be, and I will completely state that this is a, a, a controversial benefit of quote-unquote improving liver function in the short term, which may allow patients to tolerate therapy better. This, of course, depends on where in the spectrum of liver disease the patient is. If they have CHOP-UC cirrhosis and a MELD score of 38, the likelihood that curing hepatitis C is going to dramatically improve their liver disease is not very high. But certainly if they have a lesser extent of disease, that may be a benefit that may allow them to benefit from more uh, systemic therapy. Uh, I will just finish on one note. There was a controversy a few years ago uh, uh, based on the finding primarily from the Barcelona group and subsequently from others that in patients who have, who have HCC treated for cure, meaning for with an R0 resection, ablation for cure, there, was a, there appeared to be an increase in the rate of recurrence in the first six months after cure of hepatitis C. Whether this is true or not is uh, somewhat controversial, but what is not controversial anymore is that curing hepatitis C outside of that very specific scenario seems to decrease your lifetime risk of HCC, so we should not be delaying or postponing therapy in those settings. This is very important, and uh, by all means, we are very uh, uh, keen on waiting for further data that will guide us further regard how to treat patients. I 100% agree with Dr. Gulam is that if a patient has early stage disease, i.e. a patient going for transplant, by all means, treating the hepatitis C is critical because, of course, the potential of recurrence of the whole activation of the virus leading to cirrhosis, et cetera, is there. On the other hand, in regard to more advanced disease, admittedly, we don't know yet. And there was reports, there were really more, like I would say, single case reports of a certain worsening of the hepatitis uh, uh, or of the hepatocellular carcinoma after treating the hepatitis C. Does, what does it mean? We're not sure yet, but something to yet to be further evaluated. And I like how Peter put it, is that after all, we have to put the priorities here and understandably uh, in the setting of a very advanced HCC, the cat is out of the bag already and as such, the management of the systemic disease, especially with the advent of all the therapies that we're having, is going to be very critical.